Good afternoon, everybody. This is Amateur Radio and the Law, and we're going to have two topics this afternoon. One is a little bit about uh, the law governing the erection of antennas, the towers, all that good stuff. And uh, then uh, John Robert Stratton, N5A US, and Bob Familio, K3RF, are going to be available to talk on the subject of your Amateur Radio Club in situation because we get a lot of questions on that kind of, kind of thing during the course of the year so we selected these two topics for today uh, antenna zoning kinds of things as well as club insurance um, I'm going to begin I'm Fred Hopengarten I live in Lincoln Massachusetts and I'm the past director for the New England division of the ARRL uh, and yes I am a lawyer um, and I play one on TV Um, I'd just like to begin with the gratuitous plug that I hope you'll all join the ARRL if you're not already members and enhance your membership with donations to uh, our various funds to support the work we do if you are already a member. Um, I live up to that kind of thing. I'm a member of the Diamond Club and a member of the Maxim Society. Uh, and I've been a member, if you look at that certificate, since 1956. Um, it's hard to find, but the ARRL Learning Center has a six-part series that I did on the process of getting an antenna permit. Uh, and if you go to the original ARRL.org splash, it won't come up. You have to find the Learning Center. And uh, I've been promised that there'll be a link from the awrl.org.splash page, but uh, in the meantime, you can certainly find this six-part series on the Learning Center page for the AWRL. Um, and I thought I'd give you two sort of examples of things that happen in real life. Uh, case number one involved uh, your typical ordinance that deals with telecommunication towers and antennas. And it, the sentence we want to look at closely said, amateur radio antennas operated by a federally licensed amateur radio station operator shall be exempt from the provisions of this article. Little side note, when you're applying for a building permit, if your city or town has a provision that does something for amateur radio operators, be sure to include a copy of your FCC license because unless you are a federally licensed amateur radio operator, you don't get the privileges of something like this. So you need to prove that you're federally licensed, include a copy. One other thing, if you just moved into town and someone goes to look you up and discovers that you live in Dallas, Texas when you're applying for a permit in Grand Rapids, Michigan, it's perfectly legal for you to operate from Grand Rapids, Michigan, but by simply changing your address at the FCC, which can be done online, overnight, at no cost, in fact, instantly at no cost, change the address. Because otherwise, some objector will arise from the audience and create a kerfuffle that maybe you're not equipped to handle. Get away, with, get away from that so you don't have to deal with this. But the more important part of this actual quotation from a real life zoning bylaw has to do with the fact that this exempts you from the provisions of this article. Now, a lot of people have come to me in the past and said, well, I read it. I'm exempt from this article. I don't have to get a permit. I don't need a permit. I don't need a zoning permit. And all of that is wrong. What's really going on here is that you're dealing with a bylaw that was written to deal with cell phone towers, broadcast towers, commercial towers, and you're exempt from the cell phone, the broadcast, the commercial tower portion. You're not exempt from the entire zoning ordinance or bylaw. Article just refers to the section dealing with cell phones, basically. So. In, the, uh, in addition to that, 
which was just a little sidelight, the city came back at me and said, your guy is exempt from the code provisions antenna, or plural, and but the tower he wants to put it on is not written in there, go pound sand. He can have the Yagi in the air as long as it's supported invisibly and magically. Not going to happen. So they denied the permit. Um, basically, I had to put on my lawyer hat and come back at them to say that state and federal law lump together the antenna and its supporting structure as a station antenna structure. A lot of people don't realize the importance of that wording in PRB1. PRB1 is the original ruling or rulemaking from the private radio bureau as it then existed in 1985. There's been, there have been reorganizations since then. It no longer exists as the private radio bureau. But PRB1 became law promulgated as 47 CFR, that's the Code of Federal Regulations, 97.15b. And there, they don't talk about privileges for amateur radio antennas. They talk about privileges for the station, for an amateur radio station antenna structure, which is the support and the antenna together. In case you run into this kind of thing, I've run into it three times in 40 years. I thought you'd be interested to know how I went about arguing it. First, I argued that the federal law talks about the station antenna structure, not just the antenna, and that preempts anything that they're going to say on the local level. The second thing I argued was a case I had found in uh, Georgia <clears throat> where the Bridge Mill Community Association, an HOA, by the way, had been fighting a, a marine veteran named Tripodo, and they had argued that he had the right to display the American flag under the right to display the American Flag Act, but that didn't mean he had the right to have the flagpole to display the American flag. And the court ruled, quote, the flag and the instrument necessary for flying it are intertwined in the display of the flag. Well, <clears throat> that wasn't all I argued. I had a third argument. Uh, and for those of you from Florida, you'll recognize the neighborhood. I submitted photographs of some AM antenna towers where the tower is the antenna. So they couldn't argue that the supporting structure was divorced from the antenna because it is the antenna. They're verticals. And in addition to that, I argued that the radio ham was going to take his, in this case, a uh, hex beam on top of a tower, load the whole shebang as a vertical on 40 meters, because his hex beam didn't cover 40 meters in this particular case. And that's the diagram you'll see on the right, taken from chapter 9 of DeVolder's book, Low Band DX, it's an ARRL publication. Great publication. Fortunately, we've lost John DeVold at our on 4 and UN, but still a great book. Um, and I also cited to a patent filed back in 1908, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen, which is a vertical with a top hat. And for those of you who are antenna aficionados, you know now that that concept is not new, a vertical with a top hat. It was patented in 1908. So with those five arguments, eventually the municipality backed down. And we're now still in the process of getting the permit, but we're no longer being held up by the nonsense put forward at the start. The second case I wanted to bring to your attention uh, of my life is uh, a particular zoning ordinance that read that in the rural residential zone, 
one of the permitted uses among seven or eight was accessory uses and building. And this is where you have to put on your lawyer cap again to figure out exactly what those things are. This is usually a definition for accessory uses. It has to do with something that's not a principal use, which would be as a residence, for example. It has to be, normally it has to be ordinary and accessory. Um, now, with respect to these accessory uses, it said the building height shall not exceed two and a half stories. Well, now you have to dive into exactly what are these definitions, and here we are with the definition of an accessory use, which is something that's incidental and subordinate to the main building or use of the land. By the way, the use could be for farming. It doesn't have to be a house in this case because it was a rural residential zone. And the building, remember buildings are limited to two and a half stories? A building is not a ham radio antenna. It's something with a roof intended for shelter. I've never seen a ham radio antenna that had a roof and was intended for shelter. So, in conclusion, in arguing to this particular municipality, I said, yes, it's an accessory use. No, it's not a building. Yes, the height limit does not apply. No, a special exception is not required. And in the end, the building permit was granted. That was a week ago Monday. Uh, so this is kind of interesting stuff just to show you what's going on in my life. Um, I just wanted to talk for those of you who were not present during the ARL talk about our bill before Congress that will help people who live in homeowner associations. In case you were here, I'm going to go over it quickly. In case you weren't here, I'll try to be explicit. The bill we have introduced in Congress is very similar to H.R. 9670, which was in the last Congress, was filed in the last week of 2022. And <clears throat> what it says is that no prior approval, prior approval, those are very magic words because of the same words used in the over-the-air reception devices that protects your satellite dish, your UHF, VHF, TV broadcast service antenna, your wireless internet service provider antenna. And no prior approval can be required for, and then we wrote in basically four kinds of, I think of them as safe harbor antennas. That is, these are antennas that the local condo association, the home order station, cannot, cannot muck with. You didn't know I'd be able to get away with that, did you? Um, First is a, an antenna that's less than or equal to one meter in diameter or diagonal. And this first photograph looks like a direct TV dish. It's actually the dish that was used in an article by W6NBC in QST of March 2016, page 37. And it's a dish that was converted into a two meter slot antenna indistinguishable and therefore I don't understand the public policy reason why you should be allowed to have a dish satellite TV should be allowed to use the very same style of antenna for T for antenna comes under a, uh, an antenna under the OTARD rule is the picture to the right which is about a 40 foot uh, I think this is an HDBX 48 or something like that, with about a six-foot boom TV VHF Yagi. Actual photograph actually at, at the condo. You, whose antenna this is, is here at Dayton this weekend. A uh, great guy, and a whole lot smarter than I am. He's a real engineer. Uh, the second kind of antenna that would be a safe harbor antenna, an antenna that could not be refused by a condo association, would be a flagpole less than or equal to 43 feet. And this is because there's, as a policy matter, the right to display the American flag and the thing 
have a second use where a radio amateur uses it to What's the flag graph you see here belongs to AA9 Bravo Zulu in Virginia. And it's behind his house. And the thing about this photograph is since you were looking from way back behind his house towards his house, you'll notice that even at 43 feet, it cannot be seen from the street. So I think that any opponent would be hard pressed to argue that it's visual blight homeowner association. Lastly, the four of the four kinds of safe harbor antennas, we're proposing that verticals including whips and tilt over antennas, by the way, the idea of including whips and tilt over antennas came from N6AA who's in the audience today. He told me I should think about including 43 foot verticals. Uh, the photograph you see on the bottom is a standard buddy pole which is illegal to use in condos that have these no outdoor antenna kinds of regulations. But it should be reasons legal to use because it's not really going to change the character of the neighborhood. So one of the questions I normally get at a forum like this is, why do you want to go out and break this solemn contract between the homeowner and the homeowner association this solemn contract, otherwise known as the Common Covenants and Restraints of Record. Um, and the answer is, these things are not sacred. HOAs have prohibited in the past, until it was changed by either state or federal law, such things as the display of the American flag, solar panels, energy efficient roofing, shingles, rainwater collection systems composting outdoors, seriscaping, which is desert landscaping using very little water, certain types of turf, they tell you you can only plant one kind of grass, uh, certain makes and models of automobiles, including a Texas case where they tried to ban F Ford F-150 pickup trucks, clotheslines, political signs, standby electric generators, satellite TV dishes, VHF and UHF, TV masts, towers and antennas, wireless internet service provider, mast towers and antennas. Um, so I want to short two examples of things I run into in my life, hoping that you might find them interesting. Arguments that are used, pro and con, the amateur radio antennas. Uh, I have a pile of books here. These are uh, normally found for $49.95 at DX Engineering in the AWRL bookshop. Bookshop. If anyone wants one, walk up here, put $40 cash card, and I'm going to the airport to catch a five, a uh, seven o'clock flight. So I'm not going to hang around. I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Now is your chance if you want to copy the book. Normally at this talk, I people approach me and I. I I get, I get rid of about three or four of them. In any event, thank you for listening. And the next talk is going to be uh, K3RF and N5AUS talking about club insurance issues. And then, because I've made this talk so short, you're going to have lots of time to ask questions. Somebody wants to ask a question, yeah, we'll take a question. Um, what have I done? Let me, uh, I think you need an engineer to do this. I'm happy to give up the post. An engineer who's also a lawyer. There we go. Maybe. There we go.
Uh, how do you want to? We're, we're going we're gonna to do this kind of ad hoc that I did not know I would be here before you ask. Yeah, but it's okay because it's a great test. You want to start? Insurance is... Uh, here you go. Sorry, what? Okay. How many of you know what an insurance policy is? You're wrong. for premiums paid and a denial of liability. <clears throat> You're playing a betting game with the insurance companies. What we're going to try and talk about is, is also, clubs can take many forms. They can be an committed in operation. They can be LLCs. Each one of them has different virtues, different faults. The issue is how do we Ensure each one of those forms, and how do I? Issue of are you covered when you show up for a volunteer event individually, not as a member of the club? Are you covered by any laws? Are you protected by any laws? Are you? Do you have? We'll protect. And then at the end, we're going to talk about a problem that's beginning to arise where you are not. We'll do it. I, <clears throat> a um, seminar that was done in the amateur. And this insurance, uh, insurance committee double part of the committee to look at specialized insurance that is other than the insurance. To be that. Turned about have given us feedback that the political and legal climate is today. So, uh, one I may be covered for, for insurance for that. Some of that. But the, the next question was, what about my individual liability? And even if I'm not technically liable because of the Volunteer Protection Act of 1997 or a lot of the goods that many of our states have, questions have been, uh, I think that the club is properly incorporated. You're protected from liability if the club does something that causes injury. Let's leave the eventually uh, that uh, clubs or hands leave to be
it covers almost anything and everything a club will do. But if John's in a club and something bad happens and the club is sued, the club has liability insurance up to a million, maybe two, and is provided, as Bob said, insurance defense. Did you, did you, any of you watch cops? A few of you do. Okay. What's the old saying? Uh, you can beat the rap. You can't beat the ride. The cost of defending litigation, even if you are right, will break you. If your club gets sued and you have no insurance, your club's out of existence. You want to guess how much we pay, we charge per hour? It will break a club. Insurance defense lawyers may work for less than we do. It will break financially the club. I was talking about John here. His club gets sued. The club has got an insurance policy. It's got insurance the lawyers to defend it. However, because John was the actor that did something. Sorry, John, you ran over the puppy. The attorney who's suing on behalf of the puppy's owner is probably going to sue John and the club. In litigation, how many of you know what it's all about? Money, right. If you're suing, if we're looking at attorneys and I'm suing on behalf of the owner of the puppy, I want to make certain I get some compensation for my client. I don't know whether the club has insurance. I don't know if John's got insurance. We're going to put everybody in the same room. We're going to sort this out. If John doesn't have insurance that covers him individually, the club's safe. He's not. It will eat him alive financially, even if he's right. That's what we're concerned about getting the individual insurance we'll come back to. But the club insurance that the league offers is the best deal you can get. Whatever form you have as a club, if you don't have insurance for it, go look it up. You can look it up on the website. It's cheap. It's the cheapest thing you can get in terms of protecting a club. If you are at field day, it covers the club. If the uh, child runs up and grabs that hot wire on the antenna, the club gets sued, you're covered. If the police officer comes up and grabs the wire, you're still covered. You get arrested, but you're going to be covered. But if you take this building, this was field day again, to use an example, you rent the building and use it. Often, the owner of the building will require that you have insurance. Your club insurance qualifies for the insurance. So the landlord's happy, you're happy, everybody's covered. But we now get to pass the club. What do we do about each of you, again, picking on John, is individual insurance. Most of you own a home. Are you in the bank on the home, depending on how it looks. You have a homeowner's policy. That homeowner's policy will cover you for a lot of events when you're not on the property. Not all. But not every event. The problem with homeowner's insurance is it may be carrier dependent. In West Texas, we've run into a problem where the municipalities, the cities, counties, whatever, will, when Carl comes over here and volunteers to work on an Aries event or something else, they have Carl sign a blanket waiver. Me, mm. That's okay. The problem is the last paragraph. It is a blanket indemnity clause, meaning he is liable with no limit to the county or the city if something goes wrong. Do you have that much money? No. no I'm sorry to hear that. I was going to sue you if you did. But that's because that's what Bob and I are talking about. We're concerned that that is becoming an issue. If you're covered under your homeowner's policy, how do you know if you are? Call your agent and ask. Tell them specifically if you're actually volunteering for Aries or other events. Tell them what you're doing. I'm turning out to provide communications. I'm working at a distribution center. Tell them. And when they go, it's okay, John, you're covered. Haven't put it in writing. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. Go let ahead, me, let make me interject that point. here a second. No, don't go anyway. I'm not letting you off the hook. Um, some, he, some insurance carriers do cover it, and some don't, and that's the rub. Uh, we've been doing some investigation. We're not done with the committee work yet. It's going to be a few more months because we're looking for, for policies for just this that are inexpensive for AWRL members that people can afford for a few bucks. But we have found, like with State Farm, we think, we think, and we're lawyers, 
we can't even quite tell, but we think that State Farm would cover you for that field day activity when you're using, how many here in field day use a spud gun or a bow and arrow to go over that big tree? Yeah, I hope you have insurance. <laughs> or are very careful with your safety officers that watch for the kids that are on the other side that get injured and um, that, that can cause a problem. You individually, the person that would be handling the spud gun, the, you know, the air gun or whatever to get it over that 100 foot pine tree will be sued individually and the club will be sued as well. And the club insurance may not cover you if you're accused of being negligent. But anyway, I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but the point is, is that some of your homeowner insurance does cover this, and some does not. I have State Farm and, and an umbrella. I'm not quite clear that I'm covered for any you know, suit, even if I'm not negligent, but I'm included because I go to all the activities you go to. Uh, and assuming they're not some AWRL event that is official, maybe I'm covered, maybe I'm not. But you have to be careful about that. 20 years ago, it kind of didn't matter. We weren't. <laughs> We weren't a Sue happy, and 40 years ago, this wasn't even, in ham radio, this wasn't even a, an issue. Was this a question? No, but it is now, and uh, for reasons that you see watching TV and the news. Back to you, John. So what we're trying, I'm sorry. What we're trying to tell you is that, one, it, it, if you're in a club and you're not an officer, find out if your club is insured. So that if you're turning out for a bike event, you're turning out for, uh, the club's turning out to support uh, some type of emergency that's come turning out as a club, make certain it's got the insurance. What we're talking about for homeowners policies, check with your homeowners carrier or your, your agent and find out. We've had a conversation with State Farm. That's the reason we're mentioning State Farm. Their position, at least the agents we've talked to, say we will cover you if you're turning out for a volunteer event, as the pick areas, for example, or you've got a major flood or a fire and you're turning out with a, a local agency, you would be covered. But what, we, what we've heard is that there are some carriers, they will not cover you. They're starting excluding services that are rendered by you in, with a government agency. If you show out, I'm sorry, in Texas, if you show up at the request of a state agency, you're insured. They have a blanket policy that covers you. If you turn out for a county in the same event, you're toast because you didn't turn out for a state agency. The insurance is an extremely confusing field. That's the reason we've become, become concerned about it because of these blanket waivers and some carriers are now starting to say you're not covered, which means when you leave here, we haven't given you an answer to, to how to get covered. What we are telling you, the club is easy. Just go get the club insurance. If you look in individual coverage, talk to your insurance agents, find out. There, uh, we're going sideways from personal liability, but there's another policy the league offers. How many of you own a radio? Okay, if you insure it, for those of you who have a, uh, you know, 10 towers and antennas would like to talk to you, but if you have a, a radio or any radio equipment, you can insure it through the, the insurance program we have. It's replacement cost insurance. You have a $50 deductible, and they pay replacement costs, whatever it looks like. If you put down that it costs you $10, they'll pay you the $10, so it's the 50. I know that doesn't work. But the other thing you need to do if you have the, the uh, equipment insurance, update the values. Because if it would, you could have replaced it for $100 five years ago, it's now $500, they're going to pay you the original price. Now, let me give you an example of how good this is. I picked up from the, the uh, state of Texas 70 feet of Roan 45 used because I didn't have a place to put it up. I parked it. The fact I put a chain on it didn't do any good. Someone came and stole it. Okay, censure. I called the uh, ARL's carrier. They went, it's gone. They went, okay, what will it cost to replace it? I went, let's do this one more time. This is used. Roan 45. The response was, we don't care. What is the replacement cost? They paid for 70 feet of brand new Roan 45. Their decision, not mine. The point of this is, skipping over the club insurance, 
the equipment insurance is cheap insurance. And if you look at how much they charge per hundred, it is cheap insurance. Now, what else can I insure? How many of you have computers? Two of you at least. Not counting Fred there. You can insure your computers because they can be used with the radio equipment. We have Apple equipment. Apple's cost for insuring their stuff is outrageous. All our iPads and our computers are insured through the leagues program. They're happy doing it. So if, if you don't have insurance to cover your amateur radio equipment, look into the club, the insurance that the league offers, but look at, you can add other things to it and cover a lot of things that would be far more expensive under your homeowner's policy. I no, want to mention one more thing. And by the way, the reason we haven't been going through the PowerPoint because we decided no death by PowerPoint. There's 27 slides here. We're not going to have time for that. And we just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes. I think we're almost out of time. I, I don't know when the sense. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is in looking at your own insurance policies, and again, we're looking at getting a separate policy you could buy for yourself for amateur radio activities. That's a little more complicated than we thought, but we've talked to a bunch of carriers, you know, uh, people that come up with new products and say, yeah, we'll sell you something. The question is going to be whether it's 10 bucks a year or 100 because there's somewhere in between there. People just aren't going to want to buy it. Here's my point, though. In looking at your homeowner's or renter's policy, one more thing, and we talked about this some years ago at the liability lecture I gave for HAMS. Some ordinary negligence is one thing. Gross negligence is sometimes not covered. Without going into a, a big lecture about that, the example I like to use when I talk about this kind of thing is ordinary negligence is when you're at that field day, hypothetical field day, and you're trying to be safe. You threw the spud gun, shot the spud gun over the tree or the arrow. You thought it was safe. You hurt somebody when it came down the other side. You, you, you didn't see those kids hiding. Gross negligence is when you turn to your buddy and say, we're going to scare the hell out of those kids. Watch this. Stuff like that happens. Now, the reason I use that example is there are some policies that will not cover you for gross negligence, and not just for ham radio, but for other things. So be aware of that. Now, our objective is to make this easy. Uh, and maybe we're not doing that yet, but the reason for the committee is to answer all the questions that I know I've been getting, John's been getting, as not just as a director, but as volunteer counsel, where people start to hear stories about clubs being sued. And how do I do this? I don't want to... If, if I'm not part of the club, but I'm working with them for field day or for Aries or something, am I covered? Am I not covered? And that's the genesis of this new, you know, committee or subcommittee uh, for insurance. So we hope to have more answers for you, uh, and we also hope that maybe we can get a policy for the AWRL to offer to do more than simply replacing your lo your tower and things of that sort, or covering you for liability for the club, which a lot of people. I get these calls, think covers everybody. And it kind of does, but for the reasons we told you, it kind of doesn't. That's what I leave out. Didn't leave a thing out. One other thing you might want to look at, or individual insurance, your homeowner's policy will provide for this. Pick a home. Let's call it, say it's worth $400,000. Your homeowner's coverage covers you up to $400,000 in damages. You can purchase an umbrella policy they cost somewhere from fifty, hundred, two hundred dollars a year. Those will go to a million, two million, whatever you want to pay for. So if you happen, your homeowner's policy covers your amateur radio events or activities, and you're sued, and the damages alleged that they seek exceed the value of that house, the umbrella policy steps in, and picks it up, and the umbrella policy also provides for insurance defense. So we can keep talking about this forever because we do it for a living. What questions do you all have? Sir. Repeat the question. Uh, if say the question a little, again, a little bit louder. Your answer? I don't know the answer to that. I think you probably can. So you're not insuring the equipment. Now, it probably, well, I don't know that they would do the, the actual building itself, the real estate and building. Ask, ask what's, what's the loss? Yeah, what would be the loss? You're talking about equipment loss or the place the burns down? down? Yeah. Yeah, okay.
that ends now, up easy. Yeah, that doesn't. No, uh, it does. It covers equipment. <clears throat> okay, let's equipment. assume the club has the building. It owns the building. And you, 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 uh, let's, let's assume there's no equipment in the building, just the building. The, the ARL's policy for liability, it's a liability policy for the club. It will not cover the loss of the building. That would be covered under a normal insurance policy for loss. It would be separate policies, separate costs. Any other questions? Yes, sir. If the question is, do you qualify for the club insurance, depending on, if it's an unincorporated association, if I'm oh, correct, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can buy the insurance and it would cover liability for the organization. If you're talking about the repeater equipment, that's going to have to be insured under the equipment policy. But the liability policy is a Yes, sir. It does not have yeah. to be a corporation. It could yeah. be a free association of members. Most states have what's called an unincorporated association. There's a uniform, as of about nine years ago, a uniform unincorporated association act signed in about 38 states last time I checked, which was a couple years ago. And that means that they, the states that have, apl have applied that in your kind of situation say that you don't, they will treat that unincorporated association that has some kind of basic rule about this is what we're going to do. We're an association to put a repeater up and anything incidental to that, they will treat that as if it's a separate legal entity, which is great for folks like us that do that. I don't, I do not uh, preach that people get incorporated all the time, but clubs do because they never keep up the formalities. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Does that answer your question? You had a question? Just, just on that. Good. Uh, failure to keep up with the formalities, if you have created a corporation for your club, can result in the fact that you won't be treated as a corporation. If you haven't paid the annual fees, done the annual filings, you lose the protection that corporate law offers to you. And then it's a free-for-all. Every member is liable. Allow me to interject that most ham radio clubs that I've got calls from in the last couple of decades fail to do any of their formalities. They file some stuff. They even have a corporate seal, which uh, nonprofits, even if they're not 501, uh, don't need to have anyway in most states. And they say, we're incorporated. Go, here it is. You know, here's our certificate of incorporation or certificate of association, depending what state. They call it the same thing. And they don't do any of the formalities. And if you have a good lawyer on the other side, I have been in those cases. They say, well, you know, we're going to dissolve all this and sue all your butts individually. And that is a, a problem. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. But another question? Our club has a set of officers. One of those officers is a trustee. Does he have specific roles and responsibilities to the club? Other than keeping up with our equipment, and from a legal perspective, is he more liable than some of the others because of his position? What's yeah, may I start with that? What's entrusted to him? Yeah, what's, that's right. It depends on what's meant by trustee. I think you mean the FCC trustee on the license. W3ABC trustee is whoever the, lic you know, the, the, the licensed operator that's responsible. That does not affect liability. That's only FCC liability. And um, I've been involved in those too, as Riley Hollingsworth will tell you tomorrow. Uh, but not a trustee for the, for the club unless that trustee also has responsibility for running the equipment. Like um, uh, fire companies, volunteer fire companies have, you know, president, secretary, but board of directors. But they also have trustees that only worry about the equipment, uh, specifically ownership or the real estate, they're on the deed and so forth. And that would be separate. And yeah, there probably would be some liability, but not correct me if I'm wrong, if he's just the trustee on the FCC license. That's limited to just... Right. Say again? He's both. And how does he be both? Because there's some document that says that? There's documents in okay. our Constitution that say he is responsible for keeping up with the... And that's different. Yeah. Right. There's only one problem with the, the situation that you're putting forward, and that is, believe it or not, a trustee must be the trustee for a trust. 
And if there's no trust, he may have the title trustee, but he has no obligations. I, <laughs> Sorry, but trustees have to be in charge of a trust. You love when lawyers do this. I would argue slightly differently. <laughs> and, and, I, and I've done this for years with Fred over some very serious cases. Uh, we're on the same side, which is good because you can, you can flesh this out. If, if it's not an actual trust, a deed of trust, or all the things that different states call them, in Massachusetts it's a different kind, but the, the, the documents we're talking about make the definition or say, I don't care what you call them, but John is the trustee, so he's in charge of real estate, uh, making sure the, the, you know, the safe, all the things that a trustee might do, I would argue that somebody's suing because somebody got hurt. That's a typical thing. He came to see the club, the broke their back. I would still think that John needs a defense, that hypothetical John, because there'll be a factual argument about what he was, right? Yeah. He agrees, there, that's very rare. There's a very technical thing where someone can be, and the phrase is, impressed with a trust. In other words, whether or not there's a trust, a court on a factual basis could decide that there is a trust, you just don't know it. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, why they invented lawyers. <laughs> you, you just saw it here. But you understand that once you have insurance that's effective for the claim, you don't have to worry about what we're worrying out here because the insurance companies, they always have their own lawyers. They don't hire people like us necessarily. By the uh, way, that's they, just a terrific question. Yes, it is. And that's why you get us to talk for a few minutes here. But um, it is, you want to have insurance lawyers making these arguments against the bad guys that are suing you for, for whatever it is, not having to pay $300 an hour uh, to, to your own lawyer. And, and by the way, I wanted to mention as volunteer Did counsel, no, okay. uh, well, I, I work for beer, no. It's, I wanted to say that as volunteer counsel, we're all part of the volunteer counsel corps, just to step aside for a second. We don't get paid unless it's a separate thing where they want to engage us. We all, and I know I do this all the time, a couple of times a month I'll get a call from a ham. He doesn't know what to do, he or she. What should I do? What's this going to cost? Is this really a problem? You know, whether it's for an antenna or a club liability. Um, most of us will spend some time on the phone. We can't represent you necessarily. Uh, uh, but we'll answer questions. And sometimes that is, let's check, you have any insurance policies? Well, yeah, I don't think that does anything. It's not the ARRL. You know, we'll point you in the right direction. And sometimes you're having a good day because they'll cover, even if they cover with reservation. And I won't get into what that means. They'll say, well, we don't think, just for a second, we don't think this covers, but it might, and we don't want to get in trouble, so we'll pay your lawyer's fees, but we won't pay the damages um, in case you lose, because they don't want to have you sue them for other claims that you could file against an insurance company. Not stuff I handle, I know John does. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, and it was a good question. Yes, sir. That's, this is Dale Swift. because it won't cover. You want to answer that? It won't cover it. It, it won't cover it. Be, you, be, you and anyone in the club have to be very, very careful signing waivers. Right. That's the reason we're concerned that if <clears throat> uh, Carl here goes out on a volunteer and signs an indemnity clause and a waiver, that he may have waived his own personal insurance. He, if he's acting on behalf of the club, he may have waived it. Once you get into signing documents, that have legal consequences, you need, maybe you need to f first go to church and confess your sin, but the sin you, you need to commit is talk to the lawyer. I, I mean, we're kind of like white rats, we kind of breed and get in. We've got a guy in the back who Yeah, breathe. get in trouble, but if it, you start looking to have the sign waivers, start talking to somebody who can answer the question. Yes, sir. That is correct. Right. Indemnity agreement to be covered by insurance, your own insurance? No. I don't think so. If, if you have an insurance. So. Yeah. 
if you sign an indemnity agreement with a third party, that doesn't answer your question. If you don't have any insurance coverage, then if you're liable under an indemnity clause, you would be liable. If you have insurance, it may protect you. It comes down to what your insurance coverage is before you sign the document. I'm not familiar with the statute you're talking about in Michigan, but as a matter of practice, let me, let me explain, because you might be right, and I'm not saying you aren't, but philosophically, an insurance carrier wants to know what the risk they take on for you, so, and they'll charge you accordingly. Now, if you turn around, and unless that insurance carrier will say, we'll cover your indemnification to this third party, and they know about it, oh, they'll charge you accordingly, because they take on that risk. All right. All right, we'll take a look at that. Next question. Yeah, next Any question. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the over here. Let me just repeat the question, make sure we heard it, that if you get a request to sign some legal paperwork, and I'm summarizing here, is that does the league have uh, a program to assist you in the analysis of that document? Did I accurately? You know, thumbs up. Okay. Because I get that all the time, too. No, we don't have a program yet. I'm an advocate, and we, we really haven't placed this on the floor, so to speak, the boardroom, is to have more services available to all of you ARRL members, whether it's antennas or liability or other kinds of things. So we don't. Some of your volunteer council, however, will offer an informal, and I'll get you in a second, ma'am, will offer a, an opinion. Um, not a formal opinion, but... The guys up here, I know I do, you know, a couple times a month I'll get a call, and it's been more liability and stuff like this than um, antenna. I get a lot of HOA stuff, too, but that's it, something different. Does that answer your question? We, we don't have it yet, but we'd like to, and sometimes you can. <laughs> okay? Ma'am? Well, but you can do a general article. We can write an article. Yeah, we can write. There are articles. I gave a, a talk. I've got a PowerPoint from a couple of years ago that I gave here. That's 20 or 30. That talk about that kind of stuff. But the problem with that is that without going into a lot of details, every state's a little different. The gentleman in the back was talking about Michigan. I'm going to go look that up because I'm unfamiliar with it. But he might be right. And that's why we have uh, different state laws. Now, as a general, what we call the majority view, lawyers are not educated in a particular state. You know, it, it, they're educated to think like a lawyer. Then you go out and you look up stuff. That's, that's how we work. We're not taught the law. We're taught how to analyze and think about the law. So our problem is, is that to have something so general, with federal law, it's one thing, like PRB 1 or the HOA statute. Um, it'll be interpreted slightly differently in each state, but it's pretty much, you know, you can give one opinion. For something like this, it'd be difficult for any lawyer to want to, every generalization is false. Let's put it that way. Yeah. We probably could do something like that. Actually, I think... I think we could. I think that we should convince a real estate agent who knows what his policies cover and do not cover, which is a, where it's a nationally offered kind of policy, might well be able to explain what is and what isn't. You mean an insurance and agent. under the policy that he's aware of. Yeah, I think you mean an insurance I think, agent. Yeah. I think there may be a, an RQSD article that yeah. you're talking about it might be very useful. Thank you for the tip. I think we're okay. How are you on time? Okay. Uh, we're at 45. We okay, have we have a few more minutes, so here's your chance uh, to, to talk to Sir. Hi, yes. Uh, we could talk all day long about insurance, if we have a question. I'd like to get back to the HOA thing, which was part of our first. Sure. Uh, Go uh, for it. Go for it. Uh, I, I imagine an act of Congress is what we're looking for. We yes. are. But it seems like we tr tried it and tried it, and we keep failing. Uh, an Ohio Congress.
Congressman, uh, introduced the bill last December yes. with two days left in the legislative session. Yes. Which meant two days later the bill is null and void again, as Correct. far as I know. Correct. And then nothing has happened since. Wrong. That's, okay, that's not yeah, right. that could be. So, but I've called them different Congress on my own, plus the guy who introduced the bill, and they say, well, just give us a phone call. Don't write us any letters, just give us a phone call. It sounds like I don't know what to do. Okay, let's deal with the filing of the bill. Turn this thing around. All right. I've got Congressman Hofengarten. I won't want him to support amateur radio. And I come to him and go, I have a piece of legislation. I want you to sign on to it and support it. What that means is he puts his name on it or votes for it. And if he votes for something that is stupid or wrong, it could adversely affect his election. So it falls in the category of buying a pig and a poke. He wants to know what the language in that bill is before he's going to commit. So when we filed the bill in December 22nd, if I remember correctly, and it was actually five days before the end of the session, that bill had been worked on for almost three, four years to get the language right. The fact that you want to file a bill that says A, B, or C is not that simple. You have to get the supporting congressman to agree to the language. You have to get the legislative council or views all bills to agree to it. You've got to look at the committee that's going to hear the bill and make certain they will support the bill. So, uh, I mean, in the previous presentation we did, the, you, you look at passing legislation, it's like rolling a 100-pound stone up the hill. It's kind of difficult. So it takes a lot to get there. So when we filed the bill, 9670s, the uh, HOA bill, when we filed at the end of the session, it was done very, very deliberately because at that point, we finally had agreement on the language. That language in our hands, we could then go and talk to Congressman Hopengarten, talk to Congressman uh, Ritz over here, and go, here's the language. This is what we want you to support. Now, did the bill die? Yes, it did. But when we did that, we knew we were going to refile it in this session. Now. Your next question is, why hasn't it been refiled, or why is nothing happening? In, when you start a new session, you've got new people on that committee that weren't there before. You've got new staffers. You have to bring everybody up to speed and get them to look at what the other guys knew and agreed with. Now you have to get them to the same place. Once they're all up to speed, now the question is, Charlie, are you going to support the bill? So you've got a, a stick in the ground, which is our stake in the ground, this case, the previous language, and you're telling them this is what we want. Can we get you to agree on it? Once you work through that, which is where we are now, the bill gets refiled. When the bill gets refiled, we think next week, maybe the week after, the only difference between what we filed back then and what will be filed is three words. Because someone had a question about three words. I could care less about three words. Fine, we'll give you three words. It says the same thing, does the same thing. Someone wanted to reword one sentence. We're good. But it takes time to do that. Nothing in Congress moves the way you think it does. Every, I was going to give you an example. When he and I go to see a congressman, you want to know how much time we get to talk to staff? 15 minutes. If we want to talk longer than 15 minutes, we come back next week. So it's not that nothing has been happening. We've been working on it for, what are we, the fifth month? We've been working for five months with a new Congress. Now, here's the other fun part. I want to talk to you as a congressman or your staff about a bill. I can't do that if you're not there. If you look at their schedule, they're there for a week or two weeks and they're gone. And when they're gone, we can't talk to them. So it looks like nothing's happening, but it, we have been at a full court press with two lobbying firms since January 1st to get all this done. And if I didn't answer your question, we'll, we'll answer it. The HOA bill is lead sponsor. I'm sorry. The, the lead sponsor uh, for this session will be the lead sponsor for the last session. That's Bill Johnson out of Ohio. The Democrat lead sponsor is Joe Courtney out of Connecticut. Uh, which brings me to an answer to your question. Why file when the Congress is about to expire? The answer is we had Johnson lined up. He filed. 
we went to Courtney and said, will you back the bill? He said, well, I'm not going to back a bill I've never seen before. When Johnson filed it, we now had something to hand carry to Courtney and say, now you have a chance to see it. Will you back it in the next Congress? And when you talk about bringing new people up to speed, recall that the House actually changed leadership, which means the chief counsel for every committee went from a, a, a counsel to a from counsel to a Democrat, from counsel to a Republican. Staff had to be all the staff changed over. The numbers, who's in the majority, who's in the minority, changed over. It took us five months. Same committee, okay. but it all changed because the House changed hands. Sure. Okay. And Nancy Pelosi is no longer the Speaker of the House. It, that's what it's all about. Yes, yes, please. I've been practicing for 23 years. I've seen State Farm numerous times. And I've got to tell you, maybe I'm in the wrong state, but I've never seen one of their agents put anything in red. Oh, it's very hard. No. <laughs> I uh, routinely try to get my clients who are applying for building permits to get a letter from a, uh, an agent that says, if it falls over, you're covered. It's really hard. Yes, it is. In 40 years of practice, I've gotten eight of those letters. And the only reason I think I got those eight letters was, frankly, the client was such a good client to that agent that he didn't want to say no. And what he did was, he wrote a letter which said, you are covered, colon, and then he actually just quoted the policy, not a word more. So uh, you're absolutely right. This is really tough. Yeah, when it comes yeah. to those policies, you think you're covered by State Farm, you better piecemeal every word in that policy. Oh, I, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Part of what we're doing that. is that we're working up to the underwriters for the companies. Because if the underwriter says this covers it, we're good. Local agents, you're right, it's difficult. But what we're talking about for the insurance committee, we're working up to the underwriters themselves to give them a sign off. 38. Any other questions? Any other questions? Remember, when you go out the door, there'll be a lady there. She's going to give you our bill for this. <laughs> Thank all of you for coming. Fred, you got any more? It's your session. I, uh, if anybody wants a, the a third edition of the book on antenna zoning, just come on up. Thank you, everybody.